Right, guys, did you know that around 85% of you who listen to the show haven't yet hit the subscribe or like button? It's not on that, is it? Nah, it's rubbish. So if you have found any value in watching or listening to the podcast, click like, follow, or subscribe. It helps us so much. And the bigger this show gets, the bigger Jackie's head gets. <laughs> All right, mate. So thanks, guys. Enjoy the episode. Yes, lad. Do you know where the afters is? <laughs> Enjoy it, man. It's all right. Yeah, it's, yeah, good. it's good. I get to catch up with people. Yeah, I know. It's good. It's ages. good. I know. Yeah. It's it's men. You guys are rolling. Yeah? We're rolling. Yeah. We're in. Are you going right. headphones? Are you going headphones? Oh, yeah. Headphones? Sorry. I even forgot they were around, man. There you go. It's good. That's, good. As if a That's DJ a good for- start, I isn't know, it? Yeah. DJ forgot <laughs> the headphones were there. Well, um, Denny, welcome to the afters. Thank you. How Thanks you doing, mate? I'm good. Good. Yeah. It's just living life, enjoying life. All well. Mint, well. Nice to see you guys. Mate, it's been a minute. I mean, obviously, Sean hasn't met you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know my brother, nice though. to see you. Yeah, yeah, I do know your brother, yeah. <laughs> yeah. How do yeah. you know Liam, then? I know, not yeah. Because uh, um, they were always together, them two. Nah, but if it depends what time of the night it was. Egg, I think. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, egg, 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 yeah. Oh, shock. Egg, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, shock horror. I think... So we must. We, um, I we must. I, do, I mean, if, I mean, yeah. I don't, I don't know. This is going. Back. If it's egg, then I was definitely yeah. fucked up. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Most people are. Probably a good chance I was as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, mate, we know who you are, but for those at home who don't, who the fuck are you? Um, my name's Denny. Uh, I would just say I'm a fan of music who's been lucky enough to have a career in music. Um, for. 23 years now i would say i started djing in clubs when i was 17. um and yeah but music producer engineer uh i've promoted parties um some big parties worked for um some quite well-known clubs and yeah held residencies at different places around the world at different times um so yeah that's basically me Amazing. We um we go back a little while, but we I, do. I can't remember what year we met officially, but one my, one day it sticks in my mind when I actually warmed up for you and I was buzzing because you were on like a real big rise at the time. Yeah, I think it was um, what's that track? Low frequency. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you you played at uh, you headlined Yaya in Norwich. I yes. Remember. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I remember being in the taxi and we're like, we're going to go and pick Denny up. And we're like, well, Denny's getting in the same taxi. <laughs> Fucking well buzzing. But I remember playing that gig and being, I think obviously that was the first time I actually spent time here because we actually went to the afters and yeah, 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 yeah. Back yeah. afterwards. Yeah. But um, trying to think, that was probably like 2014, maybe. Yeah, it was. But we've probably seen each other before that because yeah. you, you obviously were from a very similar place in the UK, in the Northeast. Yeah, absolutely. So you were playing in like Sunland or... Newcastle. Yeah. Um, you used to come to my party, didn't you? Future. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but you you did... Future was when you had... You guys booked... Um, where was that? You know that place in Newcastle that had the statue outside? You, oh, the Den. The Den. Yeah, it, wh- when we did the Rebel Rave. Rebel Rave, yeah. Yeah, that was it. That was the, that was the night I got signed to uh, Hot Creations. No way. So I was, that happened? Yeah, yeah. So I wasn't meant... To, I was meant to be playing in the back room. Yeah. Um... And basically, we'd booked Jamie Jones. Um, it was massive, the biggest night yeah, in Newcastle. Jamie had. Jones, D. Ed Soundorum, uh, Russ Yallop. Was Rob James there? Rob James was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it was like them. And then one of the other residents, Sean, Sean Peacock, rang me up and he kind of bottled it because he was finishing off. Oh, I didn't. And know. he was like, I was meant to be warming up in the back room. Anyway, he rang me up. Big up, Sean. <laughs> Cheers, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I knew Jamie anyway because I'd already booked him for Future in Middlesbrough. Um, we'd had him play at Tall Trees and obviously through Back to Basics when I was working there. So, like, yeah, I've been booking Jamie since he was 500 quid. Wow. Um, <laughs> so I already I already knew them all anyway. Um, but, yeah, I so I just fell into that, that slot, played, absolutely smashed it at the end, and then... Yeah, gave Jamie some tracks. And it was actually, it wasn't Hot Creations, it was Hot Waves. Mm. So I gave him the track, he signed that, and then I kind of got on all their radar. And then... Early days, that as well. Yeah, it was. It it was just on the... Well, I remember being with Jamie in an after party at uh, Rockaby Gardens, uh, which was a student house in Headingley, which we, we used to do back to basics. And then we would take the guest DJs most weeks back to this student house 
they had like basically set like a mini club up. Um, Andy Kale from DC10 came in with Tim Sheridan and tweaked all the sound system. So it sounded amazing in there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> fucking amazing. It, it Headley in Leeds. <laughs> yeah, it was. And um, Jamie came back and played there for like five hours. And it, I always remember because the British gas man came to do something on the meter and there's a full party going. And Jamie like put his... Uh, you know where you put your headphones in the mic socket yeah. and he was just going British gas British <laughs> gas he was doing that <laughs> and anyway he uh, but I remember him saying that he was starting a record label and it was called Hot Creations and he was telling me about it and I, he'd signed Rob's track Rob James yeah Rob track. James yeah yeah, yeah. I yeah. can't remember what the track was called um, and that was it and I, obviously it was like standard after party talk it's like yeah i'm starting a label and i was like oh, yeah, yeah. everyone's starting a label yeah, yeah do you know what i mean <laughs> <laughs> i started about 10. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah no so that was that was that and then um yeah fast forward to that gig gave him the track signed the track then i made another track called ultraviolet which got on hot creations and that's when kind of things because i've been playing locally around the uk for years anyway yeah um done the odd bit in ibiza and stuff like that um germany a few international things but that was from years before when i did the mix mag future hero stuff so yeah that just from that point in 2012 just that's when it yeah. all kind of started really going international for i think it would be good to go back to the origin story you know okay. where, where it all started yeah your, your career in music <laughs> long time ago <laughs> um right yeah so i got my first dex when i was 13 in 1997 so we still can't get over Everyone's how old he's doing the maths now thinking that ain't fucking right <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's well too Sean, Sean wants to know what moisturizer he's <laughs> using after yeah. this so you just, some notes. Notepad again. just uh <laughs> just l'oreal mate <laughs> um yeah so yeah so I, I got my decks when i was 13 um started djing in clubs from 17 um and i i went i did some basically i started playing in my local club which was the empire oh big from 17 empire. yeah so that was basically that was the biggest club where we were from they used to book it was at a weekly night called the sugar shack legendary legendary nights in an old theater very much like coco in london mm. um, roger sanchez speaks highly of those yeah well that's it stories. so we, we used to like i used to be in the booth with roger that's where i met him uh, Steve Lawler as well. Sasha used to be there. Um, Huge. Yeah, it was just, it was enormous. And um, lost my train of thought. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, so that's where I started. Um, I went to school with the resident DJ, Ollie. One day, one of the DJs didn't turn up upstairs in the Voodoo Lounge, called me up on the Friday. And to me, I've been going there since I was 15, every week, religiously. And it was like playing Wembley for me. Do you know what I mean? I was like on vinyl, just... Yeah, that was amazing. And then off the back of that, I started playing regularly there in the back room. I got 30 pounds. That's how much I used to get paid, 30, 30 quid. quid. You play every week? So I played most, there was a period where I would play most weeks in the Voodoo Lounge um, with two other lads, Rob Whiteside and Carl Frampton, who were like local DJs. And I know Carl. Yeah, 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 yeah. Carl's still kicking around the Rob's in Australia as well. So, um, so yeah, did that. And then I, I started, someone, a friend a really good friend of mine now but he was a promoter and i was a, i went back to an after party i was djing and he saw something in me and he started putting me around a club in sheffield uh on a sunday it's where it was in the like gate crasher days where you do gate crasher then there'd be insomniacs and then he had a party called sunday mass which was like sunday afternoon um and then he put me forward for some dj competitions and started getting me gigs in like manchester for barry and ben who wrangled grief who would later give me a residency at Tall Trees. Um, so I did a DJ competition there. Came first, it was the Northern Technics DMC um, competition. So I did that, won that. And then in the same year, this is all when I was 17, I did, there's a big event at Earl's Court called Plaza, which was like a DJ kind of, it was where all the, all the new products were shown, um, but they actually did a competition. And I actually came third in the country and I was only beaten by two like hip hop DJs. So they were doing like all. So they were doing all that, and I was just, I was just literally layering up a cappellas and just doing it. But I was doing it all on vinyl. Um, so yeah, so then that kind of, I just started playing around. Like I was playing, um, yeah, Manchester. Like I say, London. I actually played somewhere not far from here. I, I, don't, I can't remember. It was in Vauxhall somewhere. I can't remember what the club was called. Um, yeah, and then 
I was just playing those kind of gigs because it was very different then. There was kind of a local... There were so many pockets around the UK where every small town had a nightclub. Yeah. Um, and you would kind of just... Yeah, just play the circuit, really. I, I played a lot of back rooms, to be fair, of hard house clubs back then. So they would have a house room in the back rooms of the hard house clubs. Um, and then, yeah, in 2004, from playing... So Good Grief, obviously, was a big hard house club that I played for in Manchester. I used to play the house room regularly. They then went to Tall Trees, which was on my doorstep, because I'm from Yarm in the northeast and that was the biggest club in the country at the time that was amazing oh, it held Probably. like eight thousand people it was oh. enormous oh, dead mouse has played there like i booked him you did i booked his <laughs> last i booked his last that that show was me we booked his last ever club gig um and we also did faithless there and we did swedish house mafia and massive yeah it was ma like we had swedish house mafia in the main room and then we had jamie jones in the back room <laughs> yeah with us that that shows the town yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it was it was mad so we uh, digress so back to yeah so then trees. i was playing tall trees and then off the back of that um mix mag it was when they had mix mag future heroes which were kind of the up-and-coming djs because obviously the internet was in its infancy there there were chat mm -hmm. rooms and stuff but um they used to do something called mix mag future heroes so nick fanchuli was one Eddie Halliwell was one. Uh, there was loads of other people. Um, but I was the youngest ever Mixed Mag Future hero. Um, oh, wicked. So off the back of that, I then started getting the odd international gig because obviously that it was those days where the music magazines were your kind of social yeah, media. Yeah, yeah, um, What was your first international gig? It was in Germany. Whereabouts? It was in Dortmund in Germany. And it was a, I think it was a gay club. And it was absolutely amazing. I remember it being wicked. It's when I was playing like loads of kind of Chicago y West like Onions Joski, Derek Carter, that kind of sound. Um yeah, I played about three hours, but I remember it being absolutely wicked. Um playing the playing abroad for the first time is mm. like a, Oh mate, I thought I'd made it. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, I, was yeah, like yeah, that. I just yeah. I thought I was a young kid, thought I'd made it. I'd like go in there with my record bag, always dreamed of getting on a plane, you know, and just doing it. So that was that was really exciting. And then um off the back of that I then uh, warmed up for Fatboy Slim on his album tour, uh, that Palookaville album he did. And he did a university tour um, all around the country and I warmed up for him. In Leeds, it was at Leeds Uni, and he introduced me to Dave Beer. Oh, is that how you met That's Dave? That's how I met Dave Beer. Oh, right. So that, Fatboy Slim introduced me to him. And then off the back of that, it just coincided. That was at the same time, my best mate, John Woodall, who mm. I know you guys know, he just moved to Leeds. And um, yeah, Dave invited me down to the club and we were going anyway, so we were in basics all the time. And then, yeah, kind of the rest is history. Got work there in the office doing the bookings in the end, got residency and yeah, but it's just mad how the universe kind of connected. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? The dots. Yeah, absolutely. The, um, the, the basics thing, that was huge for you. I remember you were always, you were like, you were part of the furniture yeah, of basics. Yeah, that was like, for, but again, that's like the universe aligning. So when I, when I, Went to Leeds in 2000. I moved there in 2005, but I actually went to uni to do music uh, production. Like yeah. I'd done it at college anyway yeah. for two years. And then um, that's a mad story as well. Like our class was Ollie Faulkner, who I mentioned. This is at college. There was 12 of us, John Woodall, Stephen Guthrie, and an 18 year old Bernski. No <laughs> way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What? what a crew. That was, that was our class at college. Um, so it's just, yeah, it's just, I, I, I do feel like the universe kind of puts you in these situations for sure um so then anyway i went to uni did three years at uni did really well because i mean i was shit at everything else <laughs> like, honest, i got kicked out of two colleges what for on, oh fucking just not turning up oh right just like, I was gonna yeah. say, you don't look like a very we call, bad call them the wilderness years um <laughs> but or i just lived and breathed for like back then i just lived and breathed for going out djing I was just that immersed in the culture of it at the time that it was just, that was it. I didn't care. That was it. That's what I wanted to do. Um, and then on my last day of uni, I finished my final project because I'd already been um, running a club in Middlesbrough while I was in my last year at uni future. Yeah. And I booked a lot of the basics guys. I'd walked out, got a phone call off Ralph Lawson saying, can you come and meet us on the Monday? This was on the Friday. Went and met him, Dave Beer, at Dave Beer's house, and then they offered me the job doing the bookings basically. Oh, wow. Amazing. So it's like that's how I just stayed in Leeds. It was it was mad. Yeah, you you're saying that the universe definitely aligns the stars in a way, but two things you said there and two of those stories, the 
the what was the one where you went, you had a gig at Empire. Yeah. And that was a chance gig because someone did no, it was someone dropped out of the future one. So you filled in there yeah, and yeah, then yeah. James and the whole whole yeah. creations thing yeah. happened. And a similar thing happened yeah, at Empire. Empire. Yeah. So yeah, it did a line, but you were just in the right place at the right oh, time. To- totally. Massively. Totally, yeah. And then that that though just being in, in that situation has then just domino effect. Yeah. And now yeah. it's a similar thing we hear, like, you know, putting yourself out there, Absolutely. being a part of the scene. You've yeah. got to, you've just mm. got to but it wasn't even I wasn't doing it to do that. I just loved it. You yeah. said you just wanted that was all you I wanted just, to do. It's all I was obsessed with it, like from thirteen years old. Um, because I actually looked pretty young. Well, that's surprising. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. no way. No, so all, 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 all my mates were all my mates were going out and I couldn't get in anywhere. But I could get in at the Empire uh. because Ollie went to my school and um the girl the, weirdly the woman who worked on the door, my nana used to babysit her. <laughs> so just be like Contact. Then, yeah, do you know what I mean? So it was I, I I was lucky that was the only place, but it was the only place I wanted to be, do you yeah. know what I mean? So so just like obviously you've been in the industry for a long time. Like yeah. how has your um, perspective changed? Um I think it's just the biggest thing for me is the social media. Mm. Like I, I've through all the different phases, music styles, you know, what's popular and all the different bits and bobs that have come and gone. The hardest one for me to grasp personally is the social media side of it. What what about it do you struggle with? I just I struggle with I, I honestly I'm quite envious of how kids can just literally walk down a street, talk to their phone and like be oblivious to the world and I just wish I wish I had a little bit more confidence in that field but it's fi- like you can put me in front of the decks in front of crowds do you know what I mean but I just I find it quite I can talk to you guys like this absolutely fine but just talking to a thought I find it really bizarre and it's just um the self promotion side it's of a, that's what it's just the self yeah. you know I was fine self promoting where I gave you a CD or a tape yeah do you know what I mean I was absolutely cool with that yeah um or USB later or USB yeah yeah, yeah. Um, but we how we was who were we speaking to about the social media thing? Um, I think Hux was Huxley, talking about Huxley yeah, yeah, was yeah. saying that um, a method that new producers are now doing to get exposure is they'll make instead of finishing like five tracks and yeah. putting them out, they'll finish thirty loops, yeah. put them all on TikTok, and hope one goes to a million views. Yeah, and if that one pops, that's it. But the catch twenty two is you've got to follow that up. Yeah. So one of these tracks might pop off. You know, it's like a lottery ticket. It might pop off, but then what do you do after that? Mm, a lot yeah. of these kids aren't following these up, and then they're like, "It's just up and down. It's gone." And that 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 uh, exposure was useful at the time, but if you haven't got anything to follow it up so like with substance, then where do you go from there? I think there's going to be a real. It's going to be interesting to see who actually has long careers. You know, that breaks yeah, through. Yeah, now. yeah, for the future lot. Yeah, sure. That's going to be really interesting. Mm. Um, because a lot of them see people that just break through. For instance, Michael Beebe. But we all know what he's been doing. Yeah, yeah, he's he's the back, the yeah, yeah. We talk about this all the yeah, time, don't time. You yeah, know, yeah. like him, Patrick, like yeah. all, all Jamie. Jamie was yeah. flying outside space. When, you know. <laughs> yeah, Patrick was flying in the rain. Yeah, I said this a couple of times. I mean? He's yeah. outside digital, three in the morning. Like they the, put the grass These in. kids aren't just... No. Um, like they used to practice in the bedroom, like I did, looking at your bedroom wall, just dreaming that that wall is going to be a club full of people none of us actually sat djing thinking oh i can't wait to do it to a camera yeah do you know what i mean just to like it's always about the crowd response it's not just like djing to a to a camera and then you know i sometimes feel people have to play up to the camera as well in those kind of situations you kind of have to you you've been given this tool which you can get exposure in 30 you can make a 30 second clip and you put it on socials, and that could have a, a literally hundred thousand views in an hour. Absolutely, if it's the right. And that's especially with TikTok. When we spoke about this before, you don't need followers to get uh, famous on TikTok. You can have yeah. five followers and get a million plays yeah. if it goes in the algorithm the right way. Well, it's 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 really interesting about the TikTok thing because um, do you use TikTok by the way? No, I, do you know what? I need to get it. I, I've actually spoken to my uh, my agent, and he's gonna he he's just kicking me up the ass. I have to do it, and I, I think I'm just gonna do it more on studio stuff um i think that stuff sits well yeah i think i think i'll be more confident with, rather than me just dancing <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and lip syncing yeah. sorry man i love you but no i'm gonna <laughs> yeah i know do you know what i mean <laughs> no it's not for me i don't think it's for anyone else either. <laughs> yeah so 
the interesting thing for me is everyone's saying, oh yeah, the majors are signing all music off TikTok. Um, but then the other week, was it Warner have pulled all their back catalog off TikTok? Oh, because they couldn't that. get, yeah, because they couldn't really? get, like all Taylor Swift's music. Because, oh, I have heard about that. Yeah, so they yeah. couldn't. <laughs> Taylor Swift, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ding! So, so I heard. <laughs> Where is she? Where is she? <laughs> um, yeah, no, so I think that's that's really interesting that they're si using this platform to sign music, but then they won't even put their own music mm. on there. It's and it's conflict. a bit, yeah, it's like, what the fuck? Yeah. Where does that go? But again, it's, you know, a youth culture movement is this social media thing. Like my my little nephew is only five, but he sat there like pretending to do YouTube's going, hi guys, welcome to my channel. Really? Chat. Yeah, he's like, he, he just plays and yeah, does it, yeah, but yeah. it's unbelievable to like, it's just part of them. Do you know mm. what I mean? So yeah, it's just, it is what it is. It's not going anywhere and you know, you just got to embrace it. The, yeah. the way you're talking about it, though, is similar to when you hear parents talk, like grandparents talking about oh God, the internet. I'm showing my age, aren't I? <laughs> grandparents. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, when your grandparents, you know, these kids yeah, are using Tinterweb and, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I try to use it, but it's just, I can't I can't get the hang of it. And it's, it's a similar conversation, yeah, though. Yeah, cool. And I'm sure in 20 years' time, the kids who are doing TikToks now will be like, there'll be something else yep. and yeah. it'll just, just evolve. Just, just how it is, isn't it? You've got to adapt. Mm. And, but I understand because, obviously, we're not in it now. Um but I was finding it, I, I, my whole thing when I was doing, when I was on social media was just being stupid. And it was like, it was, it was almost like a, getting past that, like lack of confidence thing. Because if, if I was just being myself, I wouldn't know what to say. Yeah. Mm. So I was over the top daft and making silly videos. But if it wasn't for that, I don't know what I'd do, especially now. Like the, the content, the, the, so much content going out as well. Like people are making videos like every day. I know. I find it like people, I, I, I follow some DJs that are doing really well at the minute and they literally put their life on there. Like with their partner, um, like their entire lives, daily lives that's just followed, you know? What's your thoughts on that then? I mean, if, they, if they're both confident with that, that's fair play to them. Mm, they're happy yeah. sharing that. I... I'll share what I want, but my life with me and my missus and whatever, that's for us. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And I don't want to share that. But I'm more than happy I'll talk to you about music, I'll talk to you about records. Um because if that's what you're interested in, then I'm more than happy because I, that I'm comfortable talking to you about that. Um but it, it's just each to their own. It's I, I guess it's just carving out what you're comfortable with. Um the 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 thing about that is though um, and you'll see it yourself if you go on socials and you see the people posting their families or mm. dog videos or whatever. Those are the ones that usually get fucking really good. Mm. Like, Well, that's it. People want to see behind the curtain. Yeah, yeah. That's what it is. So it's like, uh, you know, I've just, um, for instance, uh, we've just been in Thailand and I did, you know, I put a photo dump of us in Thailand. That's fine. But it's just the daily thing, like what we eat and she's in the kitchen, we're cooking. Yeah. I'm in the kitchen. Well, I'm doing this. Do you know what I mean? We're going for a walk. I don't want to. It's like the Kardashians. Yeah, thing. that's exactly. It really is. It's that fly on the wall. Yeah. 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 Kind of. Yeah. I, I think thing. it's cool, like a bit of background, like what's going on. Yeah. Like, every now know, and again. Go yeah. into a gig or in the studio oh, that, or a bit of downtime. Yeah, but yeah. That's fine. Like if I'm touring. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm on my own, then I'm more than happy to. Uh, but I, I would find that interesting, like yeah. behind the scenes of touring. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I think there's Chris Dossie's doing that quite well at yeah. the moment. He, it's, it's not it's not personal, like, you know, it's him waking yeah. up in the morning, cooking eggs. It's like a bit of the background story yeah. of, of his career. Which, which is it's cool, is you know, cool. I, yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd like to see that. Yeah, yeah. People, you but know. I know what you mean, but not yeah. just every, you know, going just, for a walk with a dog or something. It's just, but you know, each to their own. Yeah. If you're comfortable yeah, yeah, and you're it. happy with that, go for it. Mm. Yeah, I find um, I've I've separated mine. So mm -hmm. I remember when I was on the road, I used to do not not to that extent, but I put everything on my artist one. But when I stopped doing music and I was kind of trying to separate the two and do business on one, I just started a little personal one. So mm. like I post videos of me and my last going for walks, or although I do post the odd dog video and every now and again, I fucking love posting Luna. Like I'll, <laughs> I'll show everyone that fucker. <laughs> but. Um, but I don't know. I mean, yeah, like you say, every, every, everyone's different, each mm. to their own. Um, but I do think some people can get a bit personal in there as well, if I'm honest. Yeah. Like, a bit too personal. Mm. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let's talk about production. Yeah. Oh, How did yeah. that start? Um, so, like I say, I had the wilderness years. I'd been DJing anyway. And um, yeah, it was actually a friend of mine. My mum worked at Middlesbrough College. 
where I'm from, and she said, oh, we're, we're doing a music technology course. And I was like, that could be cool. Like out of anything, because I'd gone and done like art, I'd gone and done English, and that I was like lasted a term, half term. Mm. I was just like, I've got this thing that if it's if it doesn't interest me, uh, I won't do it. It's as simple as that. I've been like that since school. So you know what? People say that like that's a thing, but I think that is most people. Yeah. Some people mm. just settle. I think yeah. most creatives. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's it's very much like that. Some, I mean, I've been reading about it. Um, about ADHD because I'm like I am convinced I've got some form of ADHD but then at the same time I'm sure most creatives do have some form yeah, of yeah. ADHD do you know what I mean and is that maybe like the chicken and the egg are they create they creative because they got the yeah ADHD? exactly it could well be yeah um but yeah I just went and did the course and then I was like this is it this is it this is where I'm meant to be do you know what I mean I turn up five days a week and I can just make tunes and it was like they were shit they were absolutely shit but it was just learning the ins and outs of it, do you know what I mean? And then, like I say, the class was amazing. They're like, most of them are best mates of mine still um, to this day. And we, we, yeah, it's just been, it's ju it was just really enjoyable. And I did really well at that. And then went to uni, took that further. And then, yeah, it's just been, it's been great. Like I released my first track in 2005 on Saved Records. <laughs> it was Saved 10. Nick's, Nick's label, uh, Nick. yeah, Nick's label, yeah. yeah so. Just catching up there. Yeah, yeah so Nick was a Nick was a mix mag future hero. Oh, okay, yeah, you said before. Yeah, so um, we both played at a club called Pinup Club in Sheffield, where I used to play regularly, and then we met there, and then again just gave him some music, and, and he, he loved it, it and well. signed it. What were you producing on back then? Cubase. Well, I still am now. He's still, oh, yeah. yeah. I'm still on wow. Cubase. Yeah, like obviously, the, it, there's not much difference between that and Logic with yeah, the yeah. versions. Do you know what I mean? But yeah, I've, I've never moved over. Yeah, did you do you use uh, Ableton? Logic? Ableton. 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 Yeah. yeah. I, I did a similar course. Um, I did music technology at Newcastle okay. College, and that was all in Logic. Um, and at the same time, I remember Patrick was making tunes, and he was just starting to make tunes because I remember when Patrick Topping uh, got his first release. He was sending some tracks to Jamie, and then the release didn't it didn't follow through for whatever reason. And then he kept sending tunes. I was like, mate, just keep sending them tunes. And he, he got that first tune signed. I was like, what do you make tunes on? He's like, Logic. I went, how the fuck do you make dance music on Logic? I just couldn't get it. You yeah. know, like everyone looks at different platforms and just it works for you. Yeah. I was working on Logic for two years and I couldn't make shit on it. Yeah. Like, I was really good at like doing band stuff. Yeah. Like, working with like vocals and layering stuff in there, like with, with, with the bands in the studio. But dance music was, wasn't it wasn't working well Cubase is similar to Logic then is it very similar is it like a lot of the same commands looks the layout's quite the same um, I always say it, it doesn't matter what it's the end result yeah, you know no matter how you get there yeah. it's everyone's got their own little tricks and techniques and stuff so well that's interesting so when obviously you're working on your own there through uni and after that but like with regards to collaborations is there any like people you still really want to work with um, I'm actually working with someone at the minute that I can't say, but that oh, uh, it's, my, it's my absolute dream. Like to work with this artist DJ is like it's prop for me personally. It's just unbelievable. I'm getting goosebumps. No, it's, it's, how it, passionate you are about it. It is like, honestly, it's like oh, amazing, it's mental. But I can't say anything yet because nothing's been announced. So I'm not going to say it. But is it finished? Is it? Uh, it's nearly finished. So I'm actually there's three of us working it. So I'm working with a big American uh, DJ uh, producer remixer. And We're getting closer. We're yeah, getting yeah, yeah. Closer. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you off. I'll <laughs> tell you off. Uh, okay, okay. Um, but yeah, I've worked, to be honest with you, I've been so lucky to work with so many of my heroes, like done collabs with Derek Carter, Roger Sanchez, Steve Lawler. Um, you know, I'd say the only people left now really are probably Laurent Garnier um, and Sasha that I would actually yeah. like to make a record with. So, Do you think you're going to make that happen or what? Well, I don't know. I've just, my next release actually out on Friday is on Sasha's label. So, uh, Oh, well, yeah, you're yeah. getting closer. So getting closer. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Uh, so... Talking about like touring, going yeah. all around the world, is there any specific place that like holds that that you hold close to your heart, or that you always get a good vibe from? Or um, I mean, probably the standard one would just be Ibiza for me, but because I've been going there for so long since like two thousand and two, oh wow, well. and um, it, it's always just had that. You know, as soon as you land that magic, and I, you know, I used to watch it on TV, and I'd be like, I can't wait to go. Like, there used to be a um, 
when I mentioned earlier, when I was younger, I was so obsessed with the culture of it. There used to be a show in 99 called Cream that was about Cream, the nightclub in Liverpool. And um, it followed like Seb Fontaine and Paul Oakenfold and that. And it was when they were doing Amnesia. And I was like looking at it, just thinking I would fucking love to play. Like that was the dream. Do you know what I mean? To like, that's what these people are that I'm listening to. That's what they're doing. I just want to go there. And um yeah, and then I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You've done that loads. Yeah, 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 I've done it loads. Yeah. So. When was your first gig though? Uh, two thousand and four. Where at? So Judgment Sundays, okay. back room. Oh, okay. <laughs> Judge Jules. <laughs> where, where, where was Judgment Sundays then? Eden. At Eden. Yeah. Oh, I love playing at Eden. Yeah, yeah it's so. changed a lot since then. Yeah, was the booth still quite up high at it that was, point. Or was it? So it was the back, the little back room. It was. You oh, when you go in, oh, the back left. Yeah. So no, when when I first went, the booth was actually on the side. Yeah, on the in the middle at the back okay oh and, yeah because it changed ends, and then it changed the ends, yeah yeah down down and then it moved kind of down here because i played for pete tong in like 2010 when he did wonderland there yeah and the booth had moved uh but i've not been in for years to be honest i've not been in when defected did it or anything oh well, so just, yeah just when, when, when defected started i did the first year 2017 um i had like 13 shows there that's yeah. for them and the booth was still quite high up but they'd lowered it right, right. and every single year they, they were just told the, the booth needs to come down. So they lowered it like another meter, another meter. And then last year I saw a video of like Sam Devine playing in there. And it's almost like boiler room vibes. Like it's down. Mm. It's just, got they're the best ones. Oh, though, so much. You know I mean? Just seeing it on video, I was like, that looks fucking a hundred times better than it was. You just want the years, people but... like clamping. Yeah, 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 of course. You know on top of I mean? it almost, don't you? They're, they're the best vibes. Um, so yeah, so been playing there. Um, done like Privilege. Uh, What's been the best one? Most memorable? You played Amnesia? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, you yeah, played yeah, 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 yeah. I played last year, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, probably, so DC 10 Terrace when I did Paradise. So I wasn't meant to be playing on the terrace. And I got a phone call off Nick Yates saying, eats everything, can't make it. We're going to give you an extra hour and you're on the terrace. So I did like <laughs> fucking three, best phone call ever. That. Three hours on the terrace. So I started off from the beginning and then it was just, it just got busier, 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 busier. And it was like, it was just, yeah, it was, it was one of those perfect gigs. You know, I was buzzing with everything I played. I felt like I paced the set perfectly um, without like having to get big moments. Do you know yeah, what I mean? It was yeah, like yeah. a proper warm up. Because I love warming up anyway. Yeah. I just, you know, I've grown up doing that as a resident. So you play it dead cool. Like, yeah, Nick. Uh, yeah, that, that's fine. Then go. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>! <laughs> oh, I was, I was buzzing. <laughs> I was buzzing. You know, have you, you've had three of these calls now. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I, I know, yeah. of these moments has been like, oh, look, someone's dropped out, or this hasn't. This person. Oh, it's, can't it's, make it's it. just. It's just you know, you keep, you keep, you keep pushing forward, man. Yeah, yeah, you just, you just, you got this hunger for it, and it's never stopped. Like you can still, you can still tell now. You've still got that fucking. Mm. I just love, it. It. like I say, I'm a fan of music, yeah. and that's all it comes down to. Yeah. I'm very, very lucky and fortunate to have achieved more and way more than I ever thought of my original goals. Do you know what I mean? Um, and it's, it's just, I just love it. No matter what, I will always make records, and I will DJ parties if I get offered to. And I want to do the party, I will go and play. And that that is it. I, everything I've done is not, like, it's all been for me, but it's yeah. been for my own personal goals. Like, even when I've had management and stuff and they're saying, like, we think you should do this and we think you should work with this person. But I was like, but I want to work with that person. They're saying, yeah, but they're not current. I was like, I'm not bothered. I know the end result is going to yeah. be amazing. And it's like, I don't do it for anyone else other than me. Keeping it's, that integrity. Well, it's like, just, it's it's, I just, like I say, I can't do anything I don't want to do. I just, I just haven't got it in me. Yeah. I'm yeah. just like, I don't want to do it. I'm not going to do it. And I'm, why should I? Yeah. It's like, if it's not fun, don't do it. Do you, do you feel, I mean, we've talked about this before, but with obviously social media now, do you think like, like individuals like Danny who's come through, it's sort of losing that connection to, you know, to, to music and the dance floor a little bit more. Yeah. 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 I think, I think obviously you have to you know it's put it this way i remember uh just to give you an example so i was playing off the back of that low frequency record when things just went ridiculous for me that was it insane. was insane it was insane remember like, you're talking about the the things you were doing and things you were getting off it was and you were just insane. like you haven't knocked stuff back it was like my feet didn't touch the ground yeah. and it was you were like hot property man it was nuts like it popped up on Facebook the other the other day, and it was like Zane Low. I forgot all about it. Zane Low made it his breakout track on Radio One. I was like Zane Low. 
It's like that's nuts. Like essential yeah, nutrient. You know, it, yeah. it just went. It was, it was a B side as well. So that just shows that anything can happen. Mm -hmm. That track was a B side, um, and yeah, it just my feet didn't touch the ground, and I went and played. Um, so what happened was then. Just to, I'm gonna have to give you the biggest story just to get to this point. I'm gonna make. So when that track came out, it was on Hot Creations. It went massive. Then off the back of that, because it was like one. It trended as the most Shazam track in the world for like a moment. Minis uh, Ministry of Sound sent the screenshot mm -hmm. and then they came in and took it off Hot Creations and then they, they wanted to make it a commercial hit. So what they did was went back, got the original sample that I'd sampled the track off and then put more vocal onto it. And we kind of, like my management wasn't great at the time and we lost control of the record. So then what happened was my track, which had started from the underground clubs, then was getting played all over radio, which was fine. It was, that was what it was. But then they put all these remixes that I hated, like really commercial remixes. And it just, I lost control, do you know what I mean? Then what happened is that, so that opened me up to more a commercial audience. So I was starting to get these bookings at festivals and stuff where people were expecting me to play an hour and a half of commercially yeah, hits. Yeah. But I'd turn up, and obviously with my history, what the music I play, I would play my set. And it was getting very, very confusing because then the clubs that I wanted to play at, the more underground stuff, wouldn't book me Could because of that. Play, yeah. And then vice versa. And I remember doing a gig at, at, in Birmingham, it was at some festival, rammed, and I was just like looking, and every single person was not asked right <laughs> no they were on their on their phones but all they wanted was that one, one record, track yeah. that one track and you drop that track it went off and then they were all just back on their phones and i it i remember walking off that gig and just thought i need to do something about this because it's fucking soul destroying mm -hmm. i was just like i did not enjoy it at all do you think that you at that point did you think you'd like kind of ruined I, I did well yeah i did do and i, I kind of did a big about turn so i kind of started knocking gigs back yeah on those lineups um and which was been difficult because they'll be throwing money at you oh, as well you know don't Philly. get me wrong like the money was amazing yeah. i do you know the money was incredible um but i just didn't want to do it and i was like that is not i i could see that there was no longevity in that doing that you were going to be hot for a minute and then that's it so then what happened was i just kind of started filtering it back and then obviously the bookings fell off like i was doing 120 gigs a year it, then it fell okay, it man. fell back but then as it coincided i started like releasing music on more underground labels so i had a run of releases that did really well and then i got offered a compilation um for global underground off the back of that and that because i'd grown up with global underground <clears throat> that was like right this is it i can reset everything here do you know what i mean and just say this is me so i took three months off mixed the global underground just spent every day going through it and then as it happens we released the comp and that went in the top 10 dance chart oh, <laughs> right? I, I but really... it was an underground comp but it was a hundred percent me yeah yeah and then that opened me up to that kind of um that world really good in america for me um around the world and yeah, it was, that was kind of my reset point, but it was, you know, there's a bit, I won't mention the name, but there's a big club in England. One of the biggest venues in England offered me New Year's Eve to play. And I knocked it back because I didn't want to be on the lineup because it didn't really fit with what I was doing. And I've never been asked back. <laughs> never, really? Honestly, never been asked <laughs> back. No. So you think it was just because- I don't know if they out. thought I was being a diva or yeah, difficult yeah. or, but I did send them a personal email explaining it, but I didn't get a response. And I don't think, mm. you know, I don't think it, but it, so be it. it. Yeah, it is what it is. What it is. Man, yeah. On this, you you mentioned something on a comment on the Huxley episode, actually, about um, when we were talking about peaks and troughs. Yes. And yeah. You resonated really yeah. uh, strongly with Absolutely. that point. So, yeah. Do you want to touch on that a little bit? Like, what, what do you mean by that? In yeah. So it's just, obviously, you're, like I say, you have moments. So I've had, I've had a few. So it's um, a lot of people kind of know me from that big record because that really kicked the door open, um, either ultraviolet or low frequency. Yeah, um, they both kind of did it, but I'd been doing it before that, so I'd had little peaks and only little smaller ones. So I kind of know how it goes, and I also know 
how music comes in fashion. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's like, I think if you just stick to your guns, it'll come back round if you believe in it. Mm. So, yeah, it just, it happens, you know, you'll have a, you might have a lift, it'll throw you back out there and, um, you know, just make hay while the sun shines. But then I've been very, very lucky. So I actually, off the back of that record, got hit with a massive tax bill that I hadn't prepared for. And to be honest with you, that's, it nearly sent me under, like mentally, physically, I got really in a dark place. Um, I was living in London and my outgoings and all, it was just, it was crippling me, like got in loads of debt. It's when things were on the slide as well, it was kind of in a trough. And that was really, really fucking hard. But it's weird, again, when I look back. So I started, I went back because I needed to get more money in. I started engineering again for other people. That was a godsend as it turned out because then COVID hit a few years later and I'd already built up a client oh, base perfect. and I worked the whole of COVID. So I was one of the fortunate ones, do you know what I mean? That managed, mm. that I wasn't relying on that. Um, but yeah, it's, listen, it's to anyone young and if you are going through it, just try try and get another sideline income is probably the best thing to put all your eggs in one basket. When, when the shit hits the fan, it's, it can really fucking, you know, it fucks you up mentally. Um, and you can't be creative in that headspace. It's impossible. So it's mm. absolutely yeah. impossible. You know, trying to sit there and write a record when you know, shit, how am I going to pay the rent? How am I going to pay this? How am I going to, all this debt, you know, these things can, it's just, it's just a poisonous cycle yeah. and it's, it's really, really bad. So I'd say, yeah, just kind of diversify. That would be my advice to anyone. If you just keep another sideline income um, going and, I think that's that's really important. It's a great yeah. bit of advice that because I think that's what me and Liam really struggled with when we was in Berlin when we had a, a, a little trial. Yeah, I, I just panicked then, and we were just taking anything, you know, any gig for the sake of well, it. Is but... he trying? You know, I was doing remixes like these awful major label remixes mm. just to get money in, but it was like I wasn't seeing any of this money. It was literally coming in. I was just going like that. Do you know what I mean? I was living in London. My obviously I. I moved into a really nice part of London. Our rent was extortionate. Living this lifestyle, thinking it was never going to end. And then, I mean, half of it was my fault anyway that I kind of pulled back. But it was, yeah. When, and then when that tax, it would have been fine had I not had the tax bill. But I wasn't expecting it. Yeah. I, you know. Oh, also, if you earn loads of money, put money away for your tax bill. <laughs> Don't, do not piss it up the wall. Do not rent boats in Ibiza. And do not pick up dinners for everyone. And forget the fancy gyms. <laughs> that, the, the mental health thing is important. We, we bag yeah, up on it all yeah. the time. Um, you know, that, that COVID hit people differently. I mean, I, I, I resorted to drinking mm -hmm. drugs and everything yeah. when, when it happened for me. During COVID, was that? Yeah, during, during COVID, I was, I was actually living with my uh, mother-in-law at the time and we were just in the house just drinking. Yeah. Just because it was fuck all to do, we we're just doing Zoom quizzes, getting dressed up and doing Zoom <laughs> quizzes and getting fucking leathered. Yeah. And it also, I was doing that to suppress the emotion, to suppress the. It wasn't depression. It was more like anxiety. It was anxiety of yeah. what, what, what am I going to do? Like you saying, you know, you live in this lifestyle. I was living this lifestyle of just doing what I wanted to do. I had like six grand on a credit card. Yeah. I was up to me tits in, not debt, but like I had an overdraft credit card. I didn't have a plan B, didn't well, diversify. That's, that's it, that's, this is the problem. Um, and I'll, I'll say this, I've had management and there's some amazing, amazing managers. If you get the right, if you get that right synergy with a manager, you can, the world, anything is possible. Do you know what I mean? It's yours. What I think is really important, which should be brought into a management especially if they're taking on young kids, because all young kids now, I didn't have a manager for years, but young kids now, they're like, just playing the bedroom. Oh, I've got to speak to my manager. <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah. I know. The fuck do you need a manager I've, for? I've asked people to come on in and have said that. Yeah, like, like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> like, what? what's going on? Um, yeah, so I would say what they need to be doing is footballers, when they earn good money, they all get financial advice. Mm. I think they need this. In, they need something in place for artists and DJs. Because it's, I know a load of people that have had the same thing happen to them. And it's like, 
And weirdly, a, a well-known DJ last night messaged me saying he's just been hit with a ridiculous tax bill and he said he's on his ass. Do you know what I mean? It happens to them. It's, even it happens. Successful. Yeah, it happens to so many people. This I could I could tell you quite a few like A-list DJs mm. this has happened to. I know a DJ from years ago. Um, do you remember Fergie? Yeah. Yeah, he, he lost his house oh, because wow. of a tax bill. Really? Yeah, this is going back like when he broke through back in the early 2000s. Right. Um, obviously, he's fine now. He lives in Vegas and stuff. Mm. But um, yeah, it's it's a common a mm. common occurrence. And that alone can really fuck you up. Um, well, I think as well how quickly you can come up now with, oh, with TikTok yeah. and, and just have that one big track and start earning shitloads of money and be put into it. I think you're absolutely right. And we we say this as well, like your finance and your fitness, your mental and physical yeah. health as well. Like that's really what management needs to be looking into a little bit more for youngsters. Because, absolutely. Because like you know, before you know it, you can be touring the world and not have a minute to even think about mm -hmm. it, you know. Well, so. that, the, that bad behavior also is, is enabled from the top down. Yeah. I'd be going to ADE with managers and we'd all be getting wrecked together. Yeah. Yeah. Managers, but, uh, agents, we're all just, it's just part of the... the it's, it's, that's part of the culture. culture. And like when I say going back to when I kind of started out, that was celebrated. Yeah. Like that in Mixmag, they had like Kana of the Month. Yeah, oh, yeah I remember that. Do you know what I mean? And there'd be like, Kana it was always like month. Dave Beer, Charlie Chester, Bez, um, Derek Delarge, uh, Mike Claire Manumission. There was like all the promoters were as famous for getting off their head as the DJs, Brandon Block, Alex P. Do you know what I mean? It was all that. And that was fully celebrated. Yeah, it was. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you know what I mean? It was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Doing the mix bag challenge. Yeah, yeah, that was, yeah, that yeah. was yeah. it. Line from one side, yeah. mix bag to the other. Yeah. It's like, why is the mix bag <laughs> challenge? Yeah, mate. It's fucking mad. Yeah, it was, this is it years was, ago. It was yeah. mad. That's what they used to do. And they used to. <laughs> yeah, really encourage that behaviour. Obviously, way, that, now it's by way, no Mixmag didn't condone. Nah, yeah, yeah, that of was course. Yeah, 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 yeah. That wasn't in Mixmag yeah, yeah. page I don't six. Know, it could have been. I don't think it was. Do you reckon it was? I don't. I don't know because I know they used to do a lot of articles. I, I'd be interested to pull back. Yeah. Mm. Weirdly, I saw. Um, there's some hard ho old hard house DJs that I know called Amber D and C Caroline Banks. Oh, Amber D, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And did you, did you see what she posted? There was an article of her and Kaz. Um, in a mix mag future heroes it was weirdly and i couldn't believe like they posted them in bikinis getting out of jacuzzi and there wasn't one question about music it was like <laughs> what do you look for in a lot like it was proper like you know nuts or loaded those kind of lad magazines it was in mix that was in mix mag how many years ago are we talking here? so that would have been like same time as me 2003 2004 yeah. so you know how like, much it's changed since then yeah, yeah so it's it, it was just just to read it was just normal then like yeah. do you know what i mean but just to go back and read it it's like well fucking hell we have come a long way yeah we yeah. are absolutely hey, go on you... well i was gonna say as well like 20 years down the line a lot of them um you know messer of the week are, are feeling them effects now do oh, you know what i mean well so... look at Bra look at brandon brandon mm. blocks like an advocate now for yeah. mental health he does loads of retreats and... yeah we'd love to get him on here yeah we would. yeah, yeah that, that'd, that'd be a really good one is that is that something you've ever struggled with, like the party scene and you know alcohol and drugs, and <sighs> addiction? No, like that? I'm lucky. I mean, I've been around it and I've yeah. you know give it a good slog <laughs> <laughs> over the. Year. I've dipped my toe in, put yeah. it that way. But you come out unscathed. I'm I'm kind of lucky. You know, there's been moments where I'd be at parties and get paranoid because I've been. I'd, I'd stay. That was just sleep deprivation, yeah. man. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It was like, honestly, if I could give my advice, some advice to my younger self, it'd be just go home. It's all right to go to bed. Do you know what I mean? What what you're putting off? Just mm. go home. Nothing good happens after the party anyway. I always say this yeah, now. Now, I wouldn't say that four years yeah. ago, but like once you go back to the afters, <clears throat> you're in this ongoing loop for like a day, two yeah. days. Yeah. Nothing changes. No, it's no just you just flatline. Yeah. And then yeah. it's you know when it gets to kind of the back end of the party and people start getting bitchy and they all yeah, sit yeah. there talking about others <sighs> and it's like, yeah. hang on, you're t when you look in now and you're like you're talking about other people but you're sat. Talking about the state yeah. of this, yeah. do you know what I mean? And they're out living their life. So, yeah. yeah, when it gets to that, it's just poisonous and it's not, it's not fun. It's not fun. No, it's not. Um, but yeah, I'd say out of anything, it was probably I did like a drink, but not, not like alcoholic. But I, you know, I've gone through phases. When I used to DJ, weirdly, um, DJing in Vauxhall, I used, I remember playing. And I drank a bottle of vodka and I had to get carried out after playing. at a gig. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's. Um, yeah, I mean that was that was just kind of like I say standard back then. I used to drink a lot, quite a lot, quite a lot of vodka. Yeah. But then I, I stopped drinking spirits. I'd say when I was heavily touring, because it was like it was just 
unbearable. Going, yeah, it's not sustainable. Uh, it's just it unbearable. Um, so yeah, and then I it, my, basically my hangovers just got worse and worse and worse. And I would go for two pints, and then I would end up throwing up. I'd go for half a bottle of wine with my missus. Go have a Sunday dinner. The next day, I'd have a pounding headache. Oh, wow! It was like my body was like. This is it. This is it. Yeah, you've so had, yeah, you've done I it. Did, did Boxing Day. Went to a, a family Christmas thing. Had some wine and felt like absolute shit the next day. And I was like, do you know what? I'm just gonna stop drinking for a bit. See how it goes. That was meant to be like dry January over a year ago. Amazing. And then yeah, I've not I've not had a drink since. That's, That's incredible. Amazing, that man. is man. So Class. yeah, but like I said, I'm lucky at the fact that I can just if I don't want to do something, I'll just walk away from it. Mm. But I know I've seen so like I've seen so many friends, especially from like the basics days, like that's it's they're just casualties of the scene. It's That's attacking. what I call them. Do you know what I mean? I've yeah, they are. I've lost so many friends as well through like suicides and things like that, and that again casualties of the scene. And it was like take them out that scenario of like the party scene and the club and all that and they couldn't find where they fitted in normal society lost so, toys and yeah it yeah. was just it was literally like that um f for, for quite a few of them and it's just so sad to see these people yeah it know. is actually really sad and it, it, th these attachments i've got loads of friends who've still got attachments to stuff you know i probably haven't got rid of mine still i think mm. you know some i was speaking to eleanor last night um and it's been a pretty stressful like week or two at work. Like, we've got a lot going on, and I've found myself having impulses to just go and get a fucking drink from the shop. Really? Just, yeah, and I haven't, I haven't done it, yeah. but I've, I felt really strong impulse to just like to suppress those emotions because that's the behaviour I used to have mm. in lockdown and before that. I just drink because that part of my job was to go out, have part. Like, to, I've said this before. I looked, I didn't look at music like you do. You're just fucking so passionate about yeah. it. I looked at it because I was getting paid to party. So I just suppressed those emotions on a, Monday, on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then kind of just wait for the weekend to do it again. And yeah, it's still not dealt with. It's still something I have to deal with every day, as I'm sure you have your mm, impulses as well. Yeah. I, don't own, think, so. I don't think you ever are not a work in progress. And yeah. I think when you get to that point and you think, oh, I'm sorted, that's when the wheels can fall yeah. off. Yeah. Like, well, absolutely. You know, it's, I mean, I look back 10 years ago when I was 30, and I was like, I don't even f look back at me. I still see myself as a kid. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. We well, definitely look like one. <laughs> 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 never, never mind the, um, <laughs> never mind like being twenty. Yeah. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Like yeah. being a twenty-year-old, fucking hell! If I was a twenty-year-old kid on loads of money, yeah. like just touring the world, dead. Yeah. But I, I like, like what you said. I, I like what you said there though about it's, it's always work in progress. Do you know what I mean? Of course, it's, it's, of course it is. I think. You can't be that arrogant to think that you're, you're fixed. Mm -hmm. Like, life will always throw something new at you, and you just need to deal with it. But you need to give yourself the best tools to deal with whatever it is. So, you know, be that. I didn't discover the gym till late 30s, yeah. but it's been an absolute game changer for me. Like, because I was quite a scatty person anyway. Um, I was up and down like a yo yo, and it's like not drinking. I watch what I eat now, exercise. And honestly, the way I describe it to people, because, you know, even still, I'm like, oh, you're not drinking. They're like, oh, fucking hell, you're not yeah. drinking. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Especially, like, people that have known me over the years. Um, but I just say, I'm sat on an 8, 8.5 out of 10 all the all time. The time. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not like, dipping down to a 3, yeah. like, hanging out my ass. Then it takes me ages. I'm just there. And I'm just, I'm happy. I'm not as busy as I was, which years ago, it was like, you know, your ego and stuff like that. I'm cool with that. I'm making music that I'm proud of and I'm happy with. I'm still able to go and do gigs. Not as many as I used to, but I can still do it. And I'm still happy and I'm still, luckily, don't have to get a real job. I'm still, you know, making money off music. And I think that's a really fortunate place to be. Mm. I think that's a beautiful way. I can love that, mate. Yeah, that we'll was, wrap this yeah. up. That was really yeah. nice, man. Well, uh, go on. You asked the... Well, just uh, one last question we always ask everyone. Yeah. It's called The Afters. Yeah. What's your maddest after party story? <laughs> One that you can tell on air. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, let me think about this. Uh, it's got to be a basics one. It's got to be a basics one. Um, it's rough. actually, I have, I've got one. I, <laughs> I've got one. But it's, it's kind of a bit of an after party of it. It's not after late in the morning, but we'd been out all day and it was like a bit of an afters what had happened. So 
Back in the day, there used to be a restaurant that Howard Marks owned called Azuka in Leeds. It was a tapas restaurant. And it was me, Dave Beer from Basics, Buckley and Howard Marks. Anyway, Buckley, we were all smashed. Buckley, um, we went to get a taxi and a taxi light rolled and Buckley put his foot under the wheel and he goes, oh, you're on my foot, like to the taxi driver. And it was like, but he wasn't. So the taxi moved forward, right? <laughs> And rolled onto his <laughs> shoe, right? So then he's stuck under a taxi, right? So then he starts freaking out, going, you're on my foot, you're on my foot, you're on my foot. Anyway, the taxi driver must have thought we were going to attack him, so he must have hit a panic button. I'm not lying. Within about 30 seconds, there were about 20, we were surrounded by taxis. <laughs> Fuck Fucking off. Next thing you know, like, the taxi move, Buckley gets out from under it. Next thing you know, there's, like, he's crawling across the street. There's a taxi driver booting him in the stomach. <laughs> so I had a laptop in my laptop case, and I give it to Dave. I was like, I need to go and help him. So I went over, and the taxi driver just goes, who are you getting fresh with? And chins me. <laughs> right. So then on the other side of the road, so there's now me and Buckley. I've been chinned. He's been booted. <laughs> and we just turn around, and all I remember is Dave with his laptop going... <laughs> like that laptop swinging off his elbow. I was like, we nearly got fucking battered. So he he hit your he ran over Buckley's foot, and then he attacked you because he thought you were attacking. Yeah. Him. So then he, so then another taxi driver attacked me, and all he said to me was, "Was I went over?" And he goes, "Who are you getting fresh with?" And just <laughs> right. and then and then yeah, and then honestly, and this was all because Buckley was pissed, taking the piss, <laughs> taking the piss that the taxi had ran over his foot. They oh, then won't... ran over his foot. We got battered. And Twenty times. Oh, it was nuts. Man. Brilliant. That's fucking mid. Love that, mate. Well, uh, well, well, yeah. Mate, Denny, thank you so much thank for coming and opening up me. about a lot of uh, topics today, which were yeah. uh, really important. People love to hear that. And uh, yeah, we'll to see you again, mate. Yeah, thank you, mate. See you. Nice Cheers, one. guys. Cheers. Nice one. Yeah. Cheers.